Now, innovation. I mean, innovation are, are a sort of stereotypical, I suppose. The idea of innovation, developing new products we have in our head, is somebody in a dark cellar suddenly shouting, Eureka, and, uh, you know, I found it, and the light bulb going on and stuff. Um, that really is not the way the pharmaceutical companies innovate these days. The research and development is conducted in very well financed and a very expensive laboratories. For example, a friend of mine uh, who works, works, works in university uh, medical department has, has, has told me that they visited GSK labs I think in, is it in Slough or Reading? I can't remember which. Um, and they're, they're the envy of any labs that, that academia has these days. They're very well financed, they're very well set up, they're very well organised. So um, that is a change. If we went back 30 years, the fundamental research was tended to be dominated by university labs. And then the, the stuff moved out to the, the uh, commercial companies. But what's happened over the last perhaps 20 years is that the major pharmaceutical companies develop their own labs and have equipped them very well and are spending a large amount of money in research and development. Now the funding for this research and development is always from the retained profits of pharmaceutical firms. Now you remember I've been going on for weeks now about that is their prime argument from pharmaceutical firms that the reason is that they, they have to make large profits on the drugs that are successful is because they need to retain the profits to put to future research and development to develop new drugs. And their argument that that cycle has to work like this, that there is no, there is no alternative to this. Um, as we go through this lecture, we, well, we've come across at least one alternative to this, perhaps there is more. So the thing, the, the really important thing to remember here is pharmaceutical firms are commercial businesses. They operate in markets, so they look for business opportunity. And they fund research when potential demand is reasonable. Now potential demand effectively in economic terms is, is demand backed by the ability to pay. It's not enough, for example, in pharmaceutical firms to discover that the, the disease that's like, been suffered by lots of poor people, for example. Um, if, if those people, their governments or their health services have not an ability to pay, then there's not effective demand. And pharmaceutical companies, because they're acting entirely rationally, these firms are not charities, they're acting entirely rationally, will not invest large sums in research and development to find cures or treatments for diseases that predominantly affect people who are relatively poor, who can't afford to pay for them. So for example, I mean, there's, there's an easy curable eye disease, which is, I think, still rampant in, in continental Africa, um, which, which is easily treated, but the problem is that people there cannot afford the treatments. Um, You've probably seen on TV over the years that, that there are charities that actually treat these disease. I think they, they say a treatment costs, I don't know, a few pounds or something. It's, it's quite a small amount. But, you know, it's, it's, more, the, <clears throat> it's more than the, the people in these countries can afford to pay. Now, if we, if we look at academia, like the University of Westminster, um, there's little independent funding for research and development here. You know, in I think in 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 this university as all others, any research we do related to pharmaceutical products, it tends to be applied research funded by the pharmaceutical firms. Um, there is very little. I mean, I am not sure there is any research conducted anywhere in the UK, in academia, where where it's fundamental research where the university is just funding its own research. For example, I mean, you will be aware that the um, the major hope for a vaccine for COVID nineteen in the UK is 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 being conducted by a commercial company, Axazeni, I think, and 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 the University of Oxford. Um, basically, what's happening there is the 
commercial companies paying the university to develop this thing. Um, it's not terribly clear, certainly to any of us, what, what government involvement here is, whether they're paying the company to develop this and companies paying the university. Um, but essentially that is an illustration of the fact that there is very little completely independent fundamental research in this matter being conducted in academia.